Here to help us with that is, of course, from Miami, criminal defense attorney Dana Swickle. Dana, thanks for sticking around. Let's go through My pleasure. Some, thank you. Let's go through some, some of these Facebook comments. From Elizabeth okay. on Facebook, she won't testify, but she can't screw up her defense more than her attorney has. That's kind. Mm -hmm. From Mary Alice on Facebook, this is something a lot of you have been saying. Don't put her in jail. Make her take care of patients who actually have cancer. Now, that's a good one. That's a, that's a, a very good suggestion. What do you think about that, provided, of course, there's a conviction here? Just let her take care of people who actually have it. Well, you know, listen, there's so many different things that could be done depending upon what the verdict is going to be. There are so many different options that the judge could do. I think it's an excellent idea. First and foremost, I think she should obviously pay back the money. But I think that would be a wonderful idea for her to actually care for the people who are ill and help their families going through a very difficult time. Aha, uh -huh. so Mary Alice is onto something, huh? What, what, about, sure. what about the other comment, Dana, regarding her attorney screwing up? Are you in accord with that very kind comment about Mr. Schwartz? You know, listen, it's very easy for all of us to sit back and play Monday morning quarterback. We don't know what he's been through with his client. We don't know what directive she's taking. We don't know what she's saying to him and if she's leading the case or if he is. So it's so easy for us to judge him. I mean, listen. Do I say that there have been mistakes made? Sure. It's easy for me to do that in looking at everything and sitting back and watching as everything unfolds. So, you know, everyone should have a little bit of patience and, and hope that he didn't make too many errors on his client's behalf. You are so kind, Dana. You are <laughs> so kind. Boy, well, I'm going to hold I back tried. what I have to say in light of what you said. Um, listen, and moving forward in the case regarding the whole insanity, do you think the defense can pull it off here? What do you think of the initial testimony uh, by the non-doctor on the stand? I don't think he's a, uh, an MD. I think he's a PhD. So what do you think about what he's saying so far? Well, I think it was very interesting. In the beginning, he provided his credentials, which I thought were pretty good. I also heard him say that he testified in court uh, for mental fitness, and if someone can proceed to trial. I would have liked to have heard from Mr. Schwartz, uh, possibly asking the question, has this particular doctor testified to the state, you know, for the state in previous criminal cases? You know, your whole entire case is your witnesses that you put on. Sure. I'm not sure if she's going to be putting on other witnesses, but this doctor is crucial. And if he could say that he's testified for the state on numerous occasions as well, then I think his credibility would probably go a lot farther. All right, Dana, great work on this. You know, we'll see ultimately what the uh, jury has to say about all these disorders that he's talking about. Uh, <laughs> thanks for your help, Dana. Appreciate it. Sure, you. no problem. Okay. Yep. Joining me now, criminal defense attorney and former public defender, Dana Swickle, and in-session law enforcement and innocent contributor, uh, Mike Brooks. Thank you uh, to both of you. You know, when... When the defendant basically admits to the crimes, which she, she has basically said, yes, I did this, her reasons why were her defense, but when the prosecution has it laid out for them, you think, hey, it's easy, but they still have to weave together a story uh, of how all this happened. Dana, how do you think they did on that? I thought they did an excellent job. Um, coming from a criminal defense attorney's viewpoint, I thought they laid their case out one brick at a time, and eventually, by the time they were done, their wall was built. Uh, Mike, what's your take? What are some of the things that really jumped out at you? We were sitting here together watching some of those highlights. What jumped out at you? Well, when, when people started to realize that uh, she maybe wasn't sick and she was starting to use this money for other things, and no, there was one point where she just wanted cash. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I tell you what, the, the second interview by the detective, mm -hmm. I think that was kind of uh, put a bow on the package. Um, Dana, how powerful is it when her friends, friend after friend, gets up there and talks about um, what they did for her. <laughs> I mean, thousands and thousands of dollars coming in, the banners they made for her and her, ch mm -hmm. her children. How powerful is that? It's extremely powerful. Uh, you know, how do you get beyond something like that? These are her friends. These are the community members. And the fact that they discussed the children and that she could possibly die and leave these two children all alone, it is so powerful when a jury hears things like that that it is just devastating to get beyond.
And that's why she sat there the whole time, Rochelle. She has not looked up one time because mm -hmm. she can't face those people and look those people in the eye because she's so ashamed. Do you believe the prosecution when they say, you know what, if, if the defense could have proven, could have made a case that there was some sort of mental illness here, we would have been open to that. Do you believe them when they say that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and when uh, Detective Sean Johnson was looking into this allegation mm -hmm. early on and started looking into her medical records, and the CAT scans and everything else didn't show any signs of any brain tumor. Mm -hmm. uh, that also, was it. Also, go ahead, Dana. Oh, thanks. Also, I thought it was very interesting. We just had uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Witherspoon's testimony on, mm -hmm. and he did not say one time that there was a nexus or a correlation between the mental health illnesses that she was diagnosed with and her inability to stop the lie and then to prevent it from going any further. Had there been a doctor possibly that could be able to say something like that, that there was this actual nexus, um, there would have been, I think the state probably would have listened. Criminal defense attorney and former public defender Dana Swickle and in session law enforcement analyst and contributor Mike Brooks. Dana, I want to go straight to you. Is the problem that the defense put on one witness or is the problem that the defense put on this particular witness? I, I think it's a problem in, in general, all the way around. Okay. Uh, you know, I think that the, that the doctor did the best that he could do under the circumstances. Look, your case is only as good as your witness and your witness is only as good as you are. Mm -hmm. There are certain questions that need to be asked. You gotta derive certain answers from your witness. And if you can't get those answers, then your case is not any good. I feel like when I watched the direct examination by Mr. Schwartz, the doctor was trying to feed him information and they didn't go further with it. Uh, Mr. Schwartz should have gone in depth more into the medical diagnosis and then once again made that connection between the medical diagnosis mm -hmm. and her inability to one, stop what was going on and or two, come forward and say, hey, that's not going on. I also feel like this was more of like a witch hunt, really. I mean, you saw the clip where her, the father of her two children were sitting in there and they looked angry. So why were why were why was there not one person willing to step up and talk about her previous mental health history? There was a problem here. This case should have never gone to trial. Period. Okay, Daniel. Let me ask you this. I know it's always a risk to put your client on the stand, but if the point they're trying to make is she didn't do this on purpose, this was bigger than her. This was something that got out of control. Something she couldn't control, perhaps because of a mental illness. Would you have taken the risk and put her on the stand and, and, and let her try to plead her case? You know, I would love to be able to give you an intelligent answer to that. You know, if I had, if I was her lawyer and I had an ability to review everything, mm -hmm. here's the problem with that. You know, the only reason to put her on the stand, in my opinion, would be to try to gain some sensitivity f from anybody, right. from the judge, from the jury, something, something to make her, for people to feel sorry for her, that she probably was so mentally ill that she couldn't get her way out of this. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you watch the interview in the jail, yes, she cried, yes, she apologized to her friend, but then she was also blaming it on other people, saying she took me out for the pedicure, she dragged me out, I kept saying no. I don't know how convincing she could have been. And once again, I'm going to use the word as this was a witch hunt. The entire community was against her. Listen, it was $16,000. Was it horrendous what she did? Absolutely. But all of this for that, you know, it's questionable. Mike, Absolutely. I, Mike, I was about to say, oh, I bet you have oh, a reaction to that. Not yeah, but hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because she... <laughs>